The next segment of the Driving Business Growth Program under leadership and self-improvement deals with productivity. First segment we talked about was mindset. This segment talks about what we need to do to be personally productive. You know, all of us start out every day, or some of us anyway, start out every day thinking everything has the same priority. And what happens? We get very little done. We sometimes wonder what I shall do versus what I need to do, and invariably, without clarity and without focus, what we need to do gets placed in the second place by what I shall do. We tend to chase after smaller, simpler things and leave the most important things for later on. I once had a client told me what his list of activities were for the week, and he had all the easy stuff first. And I said, why aren't you tackling the hard stuff first? Because I figured I'd save that till the end of the week. Well, surprise, surprise, the week goes on, other distractions get in the way, and the important stuff, the hard things, never get done, and they get pushed to the next week. Little did my client know that that type of an approach, taking the easy stuff first, would have long-term detrimental effects on his business. That required a coaching session with me on priority setting and clarity and focus on what needed to be achieved. You know, General Patton once said, that you have to be of singular focus, and once you have that clarity, you drive to that objective until you've achieved it. So with that as background, I want to go through what I consider to be the 10 keys to personal productivity. So the first key aspect of personal productivity, the first of the 10, is self-discipline. The best definition of, of self-discipline that I've heard is very simple. You do what you're supposed to do, when you're supposed to do it, even though you don't feel like doing it. How often do we get distracted when we know we have to do an important task? Or we have to make what may be an unpleasant call to a vendor or a client, and then we find something else to do before we make that call. We weren't ready to make that decision. We weren't ready to take that action. Now, what feeds self-discipline, what, what helps you develop it, is you have clarity on what is the outcome you're trying to achieve. If you're not sure what you want to achieve, there's no way you can have self-discipline. Okay? Now, there's an old expression out there, and unfortunately I didn't, I didn't come up with it, but it's very simple. It's talent without focus or self-discipline is like an octopus on roller skates. Think about that for a second, what an octopus, which, which by the way has six legs and two arms, I found that out, but it has eight tentacles. Think about that, an octopus, with roller skates on. An awful lot of movement side to side, back and forth, but no steady progress forward. Self-discipline. Do what you're supposed to do, when you're supposed to do it, even though you don't feel like doing it. Persistence. The best way to define persistence is for me to tell you a story. There once was a tribe in the Amazon jungle that had a 100% success rate that every time they did their rain dance, it rained. Now this was pretty amazing because all of the neighboring tribes had a 50 at best 60 percent success rate on their rain dance. So that piqued the interest of a bunch of anthropologists over here in Princeton University and they piled all their gear into a canoe and they went deep into the Amazon jungle to live with the tribe that had the 100 percent success rate in their rain dance. And they lived with them for six months studying them. And at the end of six months they came out with this exhaustive report which concluded that they didn't stop dancing until it rained. And that's what persistence is all about. Not giving up, pushing through to completion, and not, not trying to take an easy path when you find an obstacle. Persistence means not giving up. If there's something that you're passionate about, that you believe in, that has value, then by God, see it through to completion. You know, there are times, and we've all experienced it, when we're working on something and we hit a barrier or an obstacle, we get knocked down, we get dirty. People who are resilient know how to get up, dust themselves off, take what they learn from that experience, and apply it to keep moving forward. That's what resilient people do. They keep moving forward. They are driven by that voice that says, you can do this. And when you couple resilience with persistence, with self-discipline, you pretty much have an unstoppable formula for success. So resilient people know how to keep moving forward even when they encounter a barrier 
or an obstacle. A next important component of personal productivity is clarity. So let me be clear. Clarity means you are crystal clear on exactly what you're trying to achieve. There is no doubt. I don't know if you saw the movie A Few Good Men, but do you remember that scene in the courtroom where Tom Cruise is questioning Jack Nicholson? And Jack Nicholson barks back at Tom Cruise, are you clear? Are you clear? And that's exactly the importance of clarity. Because without clarity, without being clear, how do you know what resources you will need? How will you direct others? How will you know if you've achieved the, 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 the outcome? Clarity is critically important and is a first step before you start to spend time and money and other people's times in achieving an objective. A word that I use almost daily in my conversations with clients, or for that matter, anyone who'll listen, is the word outcomes. We don't spend enough time thinking about outcomes. Let me explain. You're going to go to a meeting. You walk into the meeting. Do you know what the outcome of that meeting is? Why are we having the meeting? What's the purpose? You're going to spend money on a project. What is the outcome you want to achieve? You're going to send employees to a training program. What is the outcome? What do we want them to do when they return? Without outcomes, you set yourself up for vague and undefinable, out, undefinable achievement. In fact, it isn't achievement at all. It's a waste of time and money. Outcomes drive organizations forward. So you have to learn to use the word outcomes in everything you do. And it's a very simple phrase. What is the outcome of what we're trying to accomplish here? I've had a conversation with a client who was training a new general manager. What is the outcome of the training for him to be an effective general manager? That's too broad. Specifically, tell me what the components are of a successful general manager. Start to think in terms of outcomes, and you'd be amazed at what you can accomplish in terms of your own personal productivity. Every time that I hear the phrase time management, my in initial reaction is there's no such thing as time management. I believe that now as much as I believed it the first time I said it because you can't manage time. Time has a life of its own. But what you can manage you, hence the phrase you management in terms of our personal productivity. And you management is a very simple concept. It's, for, it's based on the fact of what you're going to do with the time that you have available to you during the course of a day. Now, if you don't have clarity as to what you're trying to accomplish that day, if you don't know what the three most important tasks are for that day, then there's no way you can practice good you management. But you're only given a certain amount of time during the course of a day to get things done. That means you have to be really good, really smart, and really intelligent on how well you manage your time during the day, not time management. I remember a client on our first meeting proudly showed me his seven pads, yellow pads, of all of his to-do lists. And he wondered how he was going to get it all done. Seven pads, the long legal pads, every line complete with something on it, and in some cases more than one page per pad. I looked at him very seriously and said, not to worry, you're not going to get any of it done. Today, he's down to two pads. One pad is a master pad of list of things to do so he doesn't forget them, and the other is a pad that has no more than five things on it that he will concentrate on either that day or that week. We, we've saved trees throughout the country here. But what he did was learn how to set priorities. What's the most important things he needs to get done in order to achieve whatever objective he established in his vision, in his outcome? But equally important in terms of knowing what you're supposed to do is to also know what you're not going to do. I would suggest that all of you, at some point in time, sooner rather than later, sit down and make a list of all of the things that you do over the span of two weeks. Start that survey now. Write down every day everything you did. And at the end of those two weeks, take that list out and begin to cross off all the things that you should not be doing that can either be eliminated, delegated, or deferred to some future date. We tend to collect tasks. We're like a magnet sometimes. And unless we periodically stop and take inventory of what those things are, we become buried in overwhelm. We get buried in overwork. We get buried in frustration. Being successful has nothing to do with the length of your list 
actually being successful has all to do with how short your list is and that it has the right things on it. So when you come to setting priorities, make sure they're the right things and you also know what things that you're not going to do. There's a great book out there that every time I ask someone to read it, I get back rave reviews. And the book is called The One Minute Manager Meets the Monkey, written by the same individual who wrote The One Minute Manager. Go get it and go read it, because all of you are probably guilty of taking on other people's problems to solve. How many times has someone brought you a problem and you say, put it on my desk, I'll take care of it later? Or let me handle it, don't worry about it, move on to something else. You're becoming a magnet to other people's problems. What you've got to do is to establish some parameters, a barrier, protective shields, whatever you want to recall it, where you're not taking on problems that rightfully belong to others for others to learn how to solve. Now when you take on problems from your employees, you're denying them the opportunity to expand their knowledge because more than likely they'll be confronted with that problem later on in the future. Do you want them to bring it to you again? Or do you want them to be able to solve it on their own? So you've got to make the decision, and this is a cold turkey decision, stop solving other people's problems. If people want to come to you and brainstorm possible solutions, then by all means brainstorm with them. You don't want to close your door to people needing help. But what you want to do is to make certain that you're working on those things that you're best able and suited to handle in terms of your ability and skills, and that your team are handling the things that are rightfully so belong to them and things that they should solve and things they should learn how to solve for the future. So stop being the world's greatest problem solver. Stop taking on other people's work. There's a central theme in this whole personal productivity segment of our program. And the first several components we talked about were self-discipline, persistence, resilience, and clarity. If you cannot master those four skills, then there's no way you can master distractions. Because without resilience, without persistence, without self-discipline, you can't have clarity. And without clarity, you're susceptible to being dragged in a number of, a number of different directions. There was a good friend once said to me, he called it the squirrel syndrome. You ever see a squirrel, he looks here, he looks there, he looks somewhere, he runs over there, he runs over there. That's you during the course of a typical day if you cannot master distractions. We'll never eliminate distractions because they're always there. But what you can do is have clarity as to what you want to do in the time you have allotted. You want to be able to say no in a respectful way to people who come to you and say, hey Chris, do you have five minutes? Nothing ever takes five minutes. There's always a story. There's always more detail than you care to hear. But you have to be able to say no to protect and fight for your time. No one's going to leave you. No one's not going to bother you. No one's going to say, gee, Chris, why don't you go inside and take as much time as you need to work on this? It doesn't happen. So you have to protect your time, and one of the ways to protect your time is to be able to mitigate and reduce the impact of distractions. And it happens from self-discipline, persistence, resilience, and clarity. The last and final piece of our productivity segment has to deal with something I call the 20% rule. And I have a cheat sheet that I'm going to use for this, uh, for this segment, but I will say this as, a, as an opening remark. The 20% rule separates the brave from the cowardly. So I warn you at the front end, some of these things may scare the living dickens out of you. And you've got to be able, and I believe this sincerely, you've got to be able to do some of these things, if not all of them. So number one of the 20% rule, 20% of your clients and customers should be fired. They are a pain in the butt, and they're costing you time and money and your happiness. Number two, 20% of the things on your desk represent clutter, and they're distracting you. Clean house and get rid of all this useless stuff. Number three, 20% of the expenses in your business are suspect and should be reviewed for elimination. That should be money in your pocket, not somebody else's. Number four, 20% of all of the correspondence you create, including emails, posts, and tweets, is useless and serves no purpose. Stop it. Number five, 20% of the content within everything you write can be eliminated without any sacrifice or dilution to your message. Make your point and move on. Number six, 
20% of the prospects in your sales funnel can be eliminated. They're either price conscious, bottom feeders, tire kickers, or they're looking for free advice. This one is always a lot of fun with salespeople because their favorite response is, I just had a great meeting with so-and-so. You've had great meetings with so-and-so for the last two years. When are they going to buy? Get rid of the bottom feeders. Number seven, 20% of the steps in every project you manage can be eliminated. The more unnecessary steps there are, the more the likelihood that errors and miscommunication will occur. Number eight, 20% of the people on your project team can be eliminated. I don't mean fire them, but we, in, we, we tend to invite far too many people to work on projects and they're scratching their heads wondering why they're there. Only have the people who can be part of the solution. Number nine, 20% of what you do is irrelevant. Get clear on your purpose and why your role exists and focus on those things. Eliminate everything else or delegate it or defer it. And finally, number 10, this is one of my favorites, 20% of all the meetings you attend are a waste of time and should never have been scheduled. If after you watch this video, you go to a meeting that you don't know what the outcome is of that meeting before you walk in, shame on you. And when you have a meeting, only invite the people who are going to be helpful and contribute to the solution or the outcome of the meeting. Don't invite others because you don't want to hurt their feelings. They would rather stay at their desk and do the work they're supposed to do during that time. Well, we've completed the second segment of pillar number one of our Driving Business Growth Series, which dealt with leadership and self-development, self-improvement. And this segment dealt with per per personal productivity. And in this one, we covered self-discipline, persistence, resilience, clarity, the importance of outcomes, you management, setting priorities and not to-do lists, problem solving, distractions, and the 20% rule. All of those 10 pieces involve habits and skills that you either possess or need to possess or need to strengthen. So like we did at the end of segment number one, I want you to take 15 minutes, review those 10 skills and habits, and identify at least two, or I, say, I should say at least one, or possibly two, and then from those two or that one, identify one or two things you're going to do to either strengthen that skill or habit or develop it. It's critically important that you master your own productivity if you expect to be successful in managing the productivities of others.